I warmly welcome you to this webinar, which is the third of its kind. Uh, topic for today's webinar shall be on building a career in international arbitration and alternate dispute resolution. This event is organized in collaboration with the Asian, Asian Institute of Alternate, Alternative Disputes Resolu Resolution in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. To share the expertise and knowledge on this topic, we have invited as our guest speaker, a very eminent and versatile personality, uh, none other than Datuk Professor Sundar Raju, who is the founding president of the Asian Institute of Alternative Dispute Resolution. Our moderator, Dr. Bunawansa, will make a formal introduction of Datuk Professor in a few seconds. And our moderator, as you may all know, Dr. Bunawansa, who needs no introduction to many of you, is the chairman of the International Relations Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka and counts more than 25 years of legal practice, particularly on the areas of construction and commercial law. He holds a PhD from the National University of Singapore and an LLM from the University of Warwick in international commercial arbitration. Before we move on to the technical session, I would also like to announce that uh, there will be another webinar uh, conducted, organized by the International Relations Committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, which will be held on this Thursday, that is the 19th of November, on cryptocurrency and the latest international developments in commercial and criminal law. With that, without further ado, may I now move on to Dr. Asanga Gunawansa to start the proceedings today. Oh, thank you very much, Janaka, for that very generous uh, introduction. And uh, for the sake of our audience, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Sundar Raju uh, uh, to address us on the topic today. And as all, most of you may have already heard, Dr. Professor Sundar Raju is one of the most sought after legal experts in the area of arbitration and alternative dispute resolution in the Asian region. He is the uh, founding president of the Asian Institute of Alternative Dispute Resolution, and he's a certified international ADR practitioner, a chartered arbitrator, and also advocate and solicitor in Malaysia. And he is also interestingly, an architect and a town planner, and has also been the director of the Asian International Arbitration Center from uh, the years 2000 to 2018. He has held many important positions in the past, including being the chairman of the Asian Domain Name Dispute Resolution Center in 2018, deputy chairman of the FIFA Adjudicatory Chamber in 2018, president of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators in 2016, president of the Asian Pacific Region Arbitration Group in 2011. He's a founding president of the Society of Construction Law of Malaysia and also the Society of uh, Educators of Malaysia and also founding president of the Sports Law Association of Malaysia. Uh, professor Sundar Raju is also a visiting and adjunct professor of several universities, including University of Malaya, uh, University of Technology Malaysia, and University uh, Kebangsang in, in Malaysia. Malaysia. Um, Professor Sunjar Raju has served as the chairman and co-arbitrate and sole arbitrator in more than 280 international and domestic arbitrations. So that counts for a lot of experience and I think he's the ideal speaker to speak to our audience today on how to build a career in international arbitration. So with that, without wasting any further time, let me invite Dr. Sunjar Raju to address you and uh, towards the latter part of his uh, this program, uh, I will perhaps put some questions to him to you know get more insight from him. And if the audience has if our audience has any questions, please feel free to send the questions to me so that I can relay the questions to him. Thank you very much for joining us today, Professor Sundaraju. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asanga. Uh, it's a very good afternoon to all of you all. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be uh, addressing you from Malaysia. Uh, I love uh, Sri Lanka because the last time I was there, uh, it was in, I think, 2016 when the Law Asia Conference was being held, or 2016 or 2017, you know, but uh, uh, it was still lovely, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the peace that has come and I look forward to greater prosperity uh, and Sri Lanka is a place that, uh, that uh, has a lot of memories for me uh, as a wonderful, wonderful people, wonderful uh, uh, land, uh, and uh, let me just start off with my presentation. Today, 
I have been asked to talk about building a career in alternate dispute resolution, alternative dispute resolution. And I think we have to start with what is alternate dispute resolution. So we will actually have an overview of what is the ADR process shop for alternate dispute resolution. What are the skills and, and qualities that will be required as a practitioner? And there are different roles that you can actually uh, make yourself into. And then there is, it because it's a, a, a process that is legal and requires a certain level of great integrity, what will be the neutrality and ethical requirements? And then how do you get involved in building up a career in ADR? And uh, how I, I'll try to share some tips that I've had through my experience. And then uh, I want to actually also highlight the need for you to have a mentor. Uh, I, my personal experience has been mentors are very important to guide you and in fact, give you the break at the appropriate time. And then luck, luck is very important. Being at the right place at the right time is sometimes more important than all the work you put in. It just, it must be there. And then I want to talk about how in certain jurisdictions, how did people come up because the environment itself had progressive arbitral institutions or, or, or even uh, 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 other types of institutions giving opportunity international internet, uh, organizations. And then uh, I will share some of my views that I have on uh, alternate dispute resolution. I've prepared some slides. I'll go through the slides very quickly uh, and then uh, we will discuss that. Then, uh, right, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, uh, first slide. Oops. Do you want me to do that? Okay, I, I think the first slide that we'll go through is the overview of the dispute resolution process. Uh, it's not moving. Okay, there are a few methods that you will hear about, starting off with negotiation, then moving on to mediation, adjudication, dispute resolution boards, expert determination and arbitration. You can split these two, these six types of ADR processes into two types, two main categories. One is interest-based, the other one is rights-based. So interest-based will be dispute resolution processes like negotiation. Negotiation is just parties or lawyers discussing to settle their dispute. There is a dispute, they resolve it by talking to each other. And this is very, very common. Just before, let's say the trial starts, they may talk to each other to how to settle the thing. And this is very important. Sometimes a negotiated stance is required. People need to be trained. In fact, in many, many uh, jurisdictions now, people are being trained to actually negotiate effectively. And negotiations is very, very important, especially in, in state affairs. When you actually go out as a diplomat, you have to negotiate uh, a best deal that you can get. The next one is mediation. Mediation is, again, settlement of the dispute voluntarily uh, facilitated by a third party called a mediator, a neutral. They call them a neutral in America. But um, the neutral is a mediator, and the mediator would actually uh, facilitate this settlement. And after which, once the settlement is reached, he will prepare or she will prepare a mediation settlement agreement. Now, the third one is a rights-based uh, dispute resolution process. That means legal rights are going to be looked at. And normally in the construction industry, it is very, very common, particularly uh, in uh, common law countries, for example, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in New Zealand, Australia, the United Kingdom, and I think Hong Kong is looking at it, they have what is called statutory adjudication. Statutory adjudication, the statute itself requires any dispute arising from a construction claim relating to payment will have to go to an adjudicator. It is a fast track process and the adjudicator will listen to the parties in a summary procedure 
uh, both parties and then come out with what is called an adjudication decision. And the adjudication decision is uh, temporarily binding until a further process is invoked, for example, arbitration or litigation. So by, it is pay first, argue later. Then you have dispute resolution boards, and these are usually used for very large projects, uh, dams, uh, railways, ports, and these are complex projects, even chemical plants. So they would actually uh, placed in, in, in the contract will require a, 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 a dispute resolution board consisting of normally technical experts to deal with disputes that come out and they may give you a recommendation which can be followed or it could be binding. The third one is a contractual determination, which is expert determination, which is a form of adjudication, which is contractual in nature. And finally, of course, you all would have heard of arbitration. Arbitration is what we call the Rolls Royce of, uh, of dispute resolution other than litigation. And normally it is final and binding. And I think the most important thing is this uh, universally enforceable. So uh, next slide, uh, I go here, okay. Um, what are the skills that you would require? The skills that you would require is first, you are, must be able to make a decision. Um, I, I think y'all, everybody thinks making decisions is, is, is it's uh, easy. In actual fact, it's quite difficult when you are given, let's say, uh, I remember my first arbitration, when I had to make a decision, I was deciding whether I should make it like this or I should make it like that. It was very, very difficult. So the evaluative process and the decision-making process is very, very important. Uh, so in, as an ADR person, uh, you may have to uh, invoke the situation. You look at the situation, you may have to evaluate quickly. Depending on what process you're using, you may have to make certain decisions quickly. But it, some of it could be that you have to write it down. The others may be that you have to actually perform it. So uh, planning and management, you must have those skills because normally it is a process. It may be a, a one day process, it may be a six months process. So you must actually manage your time and you must manage the people. You may have very high level professionals appearing before you, uh, parties who are disgruntled, and you must actually be committed and professional about it. And you must bring together your critical thinking skills and interpersonal skills are also very important. And I remember one thing I was told as an arbitrator when I first started, the person said, just listen, don't say anything. Just listen. I remember my mentor telling me that. Just listen. If you want to ask questions, think carefully before you ask them so that you do not look, uh, you don't tell them how much you don't know. So I think that listening skill is very important because I think when you listen, you will get the points that they are raising. Um, there is a great emphasis nowadays on uh, written submissions. Everything has to be documented. And given the virtual, uh, I mean, the COVID situation and all these things, uh, the virtual hearings are more. So there's less opportunity for orality. So reading skills become very, very important. You must be able to read your materials, your course papers and all these things beforehand when we are doing an arbitration. But more importantly, uh, you must know what the issues are about. So, and then after which you have to actually go for writing skills. Uh, so, um, I want to talk about this neutrality and ethical requirements because you are actually acting as a neutral. There is, I mean, there are different codes of conduct and all these things. I think all of them are the same. Nearly they will cover the same thing. First thing, you must be impartial and independent. Impartial and independent. Impartial means that you will decide the issue fairly. Independence means you have no, there is no influence on you from outside. Then second thing, one of the great strengths of ADR has always been confidentiality, privacy and confidentiality. And now there's some discussion about transparency, but generally the confidentiality provisions 
in ADR, whether it's a mediation or an arbitration or even a dispute board, is that parties want to keep whatever is being raised as a dispute or a problem or an issue within themselves and within the people who are helping to resolve it, not going outside. Now, disclosure is a very important uh, point to actually show your independence and impartiality. Disclosure, disclosure of any conflict of interest, which is not only uh, uh, required when you actually first re uh, receive the appointment, but it is continuing. Uh, the quality of the mediation process is also very important that you must sustain the quality. You must actually handle it in a professional way. It must be uh, um, done following the you know, in a in a fair way or or basically having some kind of a process that is structured and you will have to explain that information uh, accurately uh, uh, before to the parties so i think professionalism and competence they will know as you're doing the the work whether you're professional about it and competence is basically whether you know what you're doing uh, and your skill sets that come about it fees and cause normally you should tell the parties beforehand. You should actually uh, let them know so that they don't get hit by a very large bill and they get very disappointed. Uh, so I, I think these are the main points that I want to raise as far as this point is concerned. How do you build your career in the ADR field? There are uh, many ways of doing it. There's no uh, one way or another but you know the general way as a young person or as an older person you will normally get involved in moods conferences seminars simply because as a younger person you may actually in participate in the moods or in the seminar as an older person you may be the arbitrator or you may be the mediator doing the mood so everybody uh, becomes known i think this is something that is uh, very important and you also build capacity uh, one way that I have become quite uh, well known is because I tend to write articles and I tend to write uh, books uh, and not because I want to show off how much I know, but actually I want to know what the subject is. So whenever I write, I learn more than I give. I always feel that, you know, like I'm writing a book for uh, India, which I think will be quite useful in in uh, South uh, Asia. And I have learned so much about the, the Indian law, the legislation, the cases, the people, uh, I think the thinking processes. So uh, I think that is useful, but there is an intangible uh, reward that comes from there is that people tend to know you. If you write good articles, uh, people tend to use, use it to actually educate and more importantly, they may even comment and they will build up on that. Um, the next way is to join an organization of uh, a membership organization like AIADR, or you can join the CIAP, or you can join the bar in, uh, in Sri Lanka or in, in, in the International Bar Association. Uh, and what you get is a learned society, opportunity to converse and intermingle with the uh, people of your same thinking because they will have committees. You can work in committees that have the same uh, ideas. And normally they will publish journals and they will have activities that are of interest. You know, I, I remember I, I was in uh, CIAP and I joined a, a committee uh, drafting protocols. For example, uh, I, I helped in the drafting of award protocols, you know, how to draft an arbitration award. Uh, by doing that, you actually learn from the committee how to work as a group and come out with a product that is acceptable to the entire world. Uh, and then you also uh, get to know people quite well. So the next way perhaps is to choose where you're going to work. So you may want to work with Dr. Asanga in Sri Lanka because he's such a well-known practitioner you know, uh, with uh, uh, amazing uh, educational background and uh, also a, 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 a well-known practice. 
So, you know, uh, you may choose the firm. Let's say you want to do mediation. You may choose a firm that does a lot of mediation. Or you may choose a construction law practice, which does a lot of arbitration or, and together with litigation. Uh, and uh, and uh, it will be related kind of litigation. So uh, that's the way to actually build your career. Uh, of course, uh, in the meanwhile, perhaps you will want to actually take up courses. In fact, I did the same. Um, you know, um, when when I first started, uh, I started as an architect. I mean, I knew nothing about law. I knew nothing about contract except what we learn in professional practice. And then when you realize that you need to study more, you will start to take short courses, you will attend talks, and you will, after that, uh, decide to do a longer course. And eventually you'll find out that you will continue and you keep on building up and more and more you do it, the more and more you will become more complete. So, uh, and my last slide is uh, about AI ADR, but I want to talk about uh, uh, what happened. Where's the mentor? I, I, I want to talk about another uh, uh, important thing is about having a mentor. Uh, in to guide you and develop your 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 challenge. Uh, I you know when I first started in 1990, I had um, a mentor. Very strange, you know. I I went. Uh, I was very active in the Institute of Architects, and uh, when I was with the Institute of Architects, I had a former president of uh, of uh, the Institute of Architects who took a special interest in me. I was a young man and uh, I was uh, very energetic. I was attending all their classes uh, and uh, activities, joining in and all these things. Uh, he sort of took me under the wings. And I, I feel that that is very important to have a mentor. A mentor does a few things. First, he gives you good advice. Sometimes you need somebody to advise you which way to go because you may not know, you may think you know, but you don't know. Because uh, of course, older people and perhaps more experienced people will be able to ask you how to develop your knowledge and skills. Uh, I think you also try to improve your communication skill because you know, I had this mentor who always uh, was very angry. Any small thing, he would get upset. But when I see him in an arbitration, I've sat in, you know, he invited me to sit in in an arbitration. He was so calm and quiet. But the moment he stepped out, he was angry. I don't know. <laughs> but I suppose it is, uh, you know, it was some kind of a way of handling things. Um, but I think one thing that you actually learn from a mentor is perspective, new ways of looking at things. Um, you, you learn, for example, he will actually um, help you uh, I remember I, I saw this advice on an interim award, which I didn't know how to handle, to write. And you're not supposed to delegate, but I asked him some questions and all these things. After I finished talking to him, I had an idea of how to do it. So uh, I think that is very useful. You know, you have a, a more senior person, a mentor who actually, you can bounce off ideas and he helps you. And then you can actually also learn new perspectives from him. Uh, and, uh, and I think that is very important. And you find a mentor, a good mentor will normally open up his network to you. And from his network, you will have openings that's unimaginable because he would have taken time to build, especially the older people would have taken time to build up that network. And uh, he introducing you to people in the network and networking is a very important way of doing things. Uh, and uh, I think uh, you will find from that network, you will actually advance your career. And uh, I think that is uh, also very important. Now I want to talk about being the right place at the right time. Um, I've always thought that Providence works in strange ways. You need to be in the right place sometimes in the right time, you sometimes wonder, you know, I think if you have looked at your career, I, I'm, I'm just thinking if I first started, I wanted to be an architect 
you know, I was determined to be an architect. I saw, I, you know, in fact, I visited Sri Lanka to see Jeffrey Bauer's buildings. And, you know, and I, I, when I saw it, I said, I can never do that. It's so lovely. And I said, I can't do this. This is beyond me. Uh, then, then, but actually, um, sometimes uh, you have a career path that comes to you. And it's either you take that path or you don't. But you will never know. But you have to be in the right time in the right place to have that opportunity. I, I, I don't know whether uh, you all have felt the same. I've always felt the same. That uh, being at the right time at the right place requires preparation. You must be preparing yourself, uh, working hard, uh, building up, and somehow or other you will go to that 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 position, and then that practice will come, and then, but never be afraid to start small. Um, I, I give you an example of uh, what happened in my case. Do you all remember the word chartered arbitrator? Everybody is now seems to have the word chartered arbitrator. Uh, it is an idea that came out in 1999 in, uh, when the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators converted its panel into chartered arbitrators in accordance to its charter. Now, uh, at that point of time, there were 199 people on the panel. And the 199 people on the panel, there were two Malaysians, there were no Singaporeans, I don't remember any Sri Lankans on it, you know, but, uh, but the thing is that the, the 199 uh, people who were on the panel were conferred chartered arbitrators. I mean, the first batch, you know, that, after that, they had exams and all the other things. But what, what I'm trying to say is that that's being at the right time in the right place. Eh? If you, you know, I, I, for the life of me, I don't understand why I applied for the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators panel. It required me to give three awards. I had to actually fill up a, 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 a complex form. I had to go through an interview. And finally, when they empaneled me, there was no work coming. There was nothing, you know, because it's in the UK. It is in, in England. And they only have, uh, at that time in 1999, I think the, the arbitration scene was dying down because the 1996 Act came. And then they had the... Uh, they had adjudication, statutory adjudication coming in, killing the domestic arbitrations. And then I think the, 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 the practices started to expand and they started to look international for international arbitrations. That's how London became an international center because they were forced to go out from, from London. So, I, but, you know, but I'm just thinking that being on the panel of an obscure, at that time for me, Chartered Institute was an obscure panel of no significance. You'd rather be on, let's say, ICC panel or it makes more sense. But, you know, it just happened to be in the right time and the right place. Uh, the other thing is very important for you to be consistent. Uh, you must have a consistent viewpoint where ADR is concerned. You must actually believe in it. You must support it. If you... I mean, you do, you may get disillusioned like, like I do sometimes, you know, like uh, I, you get disillusioned because you think too much fighting. Perhaps you want to move towards prevention. You know what I mean? You know, because, you know, as you become older, I think you become mellow. You see so much, uh, so much uh, the things have gone under the, the bridge. It's repetitive. People are making the same mistakes all over again. And perhaps then you think uh, maybe it's time to move on. But generally you believe in the system. You know, you must have that belief. If you do not believe in the system, then it's very difficult to excel in it. I think that's where I, I, I think. And uh, you must have a leap of faith. You know, sometimes when you actually decide to do something, it may seem very far away. Um, I would never imagine ever writing a book if not for, again, my mentor telling me to write a book, pushing me. In fact, he said, you know, do law, write a book. And he was saying, when is your book? I want to be, I want to read it. And I said, I can't do it very well. But nevertheless, I think that is the way um, it is. Uh, it happened. Uh, I want to talk about one more thing that is very, very important. I know people like Dr. Asanga, Janaka, and all these people are working very hard to create institutions. Our institutions are very important. Without the institutional environment, 
you have to go out. No, so if in your country or in your jurisdiction or in South Asia, there is institutions that are progressive, that is where you get the opportunity for work. Uh, and your experience will come from there. And progressive arbitral institutions and other ADR institutions are extremely important to create this ecosystem to let uh, uh, people, younger people, older people, experienced people locally to come through because there's very little opportunity. Why should someone in England appoint a Sri Lankan or a Malaysian? There's no reason. If your own jurisdiction doesn't appoint you, then I think it is a struggle to go beyond. So I always feel the domestic environment must be thriving. Then the international environment will come with it. So I looked towards South Asia as a prime, uh, almost fruit, ready to drop. And then lots of things are going to grow from there. Uh, in fact, I think first thing is the population is there and the economy is there. There is a dart of uh, institutions. So progressive institutions will come up and will be necessary or not, you'll be swamped. You'll be swamped by international organizations, international institutions coming in. And how many can it give to local practitioners? Local practitioners must build up from domestic and then move on to international. So I think cuts uh, both ways. That's why I said, you know, I'm thinking if you want to build a career, the ecosystem has to work. You yourself have to work. Institutions have to work. The government has to help. And more importantly, at the end of it, everything must fall together. Uh, and then, of course, the attitude. The attitude, sometimes it's luck again. Some people have more luck than other people. Other people have uh, opportunity. Sometimes you are, you know, you have the opportunity of being born in the right family, lawyers going all the way, you know, and then there is this tradition or, or you are, you are self-built and you become, you know, I, I look at Dr. Asanga, you know, I was telling him the other day, I said, you know, it's very interesting that you didn't do it in London, your, your PhD. You did it in Singapore National University. I said National University of Singapore, but look at National University of Singapore, number five in the world. And then it is actually one of the best in Asia. So where else do you want to go? <laughs> and then what is the thriving? In, and you did arbitration law in Singapore, which is now one of the great uh, jurisdictions uh, in Asia. We are very proud of it. Eh? So I think this is the way we should think. You know, I think we should move towards that. We should move towards uh, being inclusive. More importantly, we should build infrastructure and we should build it in our areas. Domestically, we must encourage. We must encourage young people to come up uh, older people who have experience must be encouraged to come in. Even judges, you know, I, I I find it very fascinating that in the in the in the particularly in the in the UK, judges are planning for their retirement and second careers, arbitrators before they retire, you know, well before they retire. But you know, I'm I'm watching in Asia. There's not so much as that happening anymore, you know. So you know, in America, in in Europe, and in uh, in London. In UK, they are all waiting. You know, many of them are coming out as international practitioners, joining chambers and continuing until seventy-five. Uh, so I think you know that is also a lesson for older people building a career. I mean, there's another path as a judge, as an arbitration judge. Then of course you are, you you understand the, the 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 area, and then you get appointed domestically. Then you get appointed internationally, and then uh, it it comes. You know, I, I've seen that happening to to India particularly uh, and also in uh, Singapore in uh, in uh, in other other uh, parts of Asia but it is more rampant in, uh, in 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 the western countries because it's something expected that you don't stop you continue so i think that's mainly the the other thing that i've been told to speak something about ai adr we are a membership institution so uh, anybody can join it, but we set it up for Asia. Although I was president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, I thought that it's time for an Asian and African institution. We were set up under the auspices of ELCO, with the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization. So I think uh, I have finished, I've, I've tried to be as brief as possible.
quickly. I tried to cover as much ground. So I think uh, I think we we talked about about forty minutes, isn't it? That's what I was asked to talk. Is that all right, uh, Doctor Asanga? Can I stop here now? I can't hear. I can't hear you. You have to unmute your mic. Uh, Professor Sundaraj, thank you very much for that and uh, that sharing your insightful experience, you know, in the field of ADR and I'm sure the audience, you know, really appreciated some of the thoughts that you shared. Um, there are a few questions that we'd, I'd like to put to you and I have quite a few questions coming from the audience, so I will select them and put them based on relevancy. But also to start with, because I can see from the audience we have, we have a lot of young practitioners. So one of the questions that I would like to put to you to get your insight into this is this. Now, young lawyers who are interested, interested in pursuing careers in ADR or of, very often receive the advice that they should first practice law and gain experience in another field before transitioning to ADR as a second career. However, is this advice really relevant or is this narrative accurate as far as our next generation is concerned? Um, you must have no hair or gray hair, I think, before people really listen to you. But, you know, I think one of the modern ways that's happening is that people are being trained very early uh, to look towards uh, an EDR career. Uh, they are training early. That's why you have young, young uh, EDR practitioners, uh, young associations and all these things. Uh, generally, it is actually a second career. Uh, you must have something that, you know, many of us are engineers, architects, lawyers, and then we practice in our main area or, or after we have practiced that, then we move on to apply that uh, to resolving disputes. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it, there are two ways of coming to it. I think many ways of coming to it. Uh, one way, of course, if you are a lawyer, then you go through and I, I've suggested joining an ADR uh, firm and then moving on and then building up your, your, your repertoire of skills and uh, after which writing articles, books, but that can also apply as an engineer or an architect or whatever it is. Like people like me, when I did my first case in 1990, I was an architect, I had no law. All I knew was that the first time the parties saw me, they settled. So I think, you know, that gave me an indication that basically I was not ready yet. Uh, you know, because uh, uh, because that time the, the 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 main appointing authorities, you also must look where the appointing authorities are in your country. Uh, you will find the standard form contracts will have appointing authorities, and the appointing authorities will normally be the institution, professional institutions. It could be most probably the institution of engineers, the institution of architects or quantity surveyors. It could be uh, 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 even uh, government contracts. Government, government organizations. And then, uh, uh, so you have to actually look at the appointing bodies and you need to actually reach out to them. Most people, young people start off with a, a, a you know, we used to have a plan where we will appoint, let's say about 15% of our, our, our arbitrations or maybe even adjudications, we may be as much as 40% to first time uh, adjudicators and arbitrators. That is actually to create the cadre out of which you will know, of course, they may get small cases. Some of them get, uh, so small cases doesn't mean it's not complex. Huh? Small cases can be more complex than <laughs> bigger cases. In fact, I think my worst case that I've done is a house renovation. I refused to do it. The, 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 the lawyers, both of them agreed that I should do it. They said this is too difficult. And then I said, uh, I agreed on a on a uh, because it's a house renovation. I agreed on a lump sum, and it was the most difficult arbitration I ever done because the parties were fighting. They were very aggressive. You know, by the time I finished that arbitration, I knew that nobody will be happy. And I, I suppose you know after writing the award, and I said, but, you know, it was a very small job, but I did it more as a as a as a as a as, a, as because it came to me. You know, they wanted me to do it. Uh, so small jobs don't mean it's easy, but it's also an opportunity for people to uh, uh, practice. Sometimes when you give uh, young people, you must actually trust them and let them do the thing, or even new people. Uh, so I, you know, I, I remember um, um, 
some years ago, there was a very experienced lawyer who has been doing a lot of court work as counsel. He was going in as counsel and all these things. And he has never sat as an arbitrator. He was appointed as an arbitrator. Uh, and then he turned up uh, in my office one day and he asked me, look, you know, I, I've been appointed. Can you help me? Can you share some forms with me? So I sat down and went through the process and all these things. And I think for the first time, he realized that he was actually sitting in the center. He was not sitting at the or one end or the other end, going this way and that way. He was sitting in the center and he realized that his thought processes had to change. He has to give an opportunity to the parties to present it. He cannot be peremptory, like in court. He cannot push a single uh, uh, idea. He has to listen to both ideas. He has to weigh it very carefully. So I think, you know, I think for him, it was a culture shock. So it is, uh, it is different. It's different. So um, if you ask me, uh, the best way is to find that balance. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Raju. And uh, before I put the questions from the audience, one other question for you. In fact, you mentioned the importance of uh, publication and writing. And I, I mean, I can confess, even when I was a student and, you know, thinking of going for arbitration, one of the things that I, you know, learned from my professor that my mentor was publish, publish, and publish. Now, having said that, in today's con context, as you know, publications are not limited to, you know, book chapters or journal articles. Social media also plays a very big role. And as a result of that, there are blogs and blogs and so on. So how important is it is to have a non-controversial online footprint if we will aspire to be an arbitrator? I think different people have different ways of doing it. If you are in a firm, uh, you will do a block because your billing time is so high. You know, basically is that if you write a book, you know, your productivity will drop and most probably you'll get fired because you can't bill enough because the amount of time that is required. So I see that, you know, that's why I see the firms and a lot of people write very short articles. They can spend, let's say, half a day or two hours on it and they will get something out or some, some junior will do a research and then this is the latest case, they put it there and for the whole world to see. And it's very, very useful for me because if you get a summary of uh, like an advice, but it is never sufficient to establish you as a real pundit. You know, if you want to be a person who is an authority in the field, you must do something more serious. As, as I, I think you know, your, your, your professors are right, publish, 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 but you have to publish something that's peer reviewed or in a journal, or you must do it in a book that is of some standing. Uh, now, one of the more easiest way that is happening is that people are doing, uh, uh, what we say, a compendium. You know? uh, they will get a subject and then they will get, invite different authors. They split up the subject area and ask you to write a chapter on it. I think that is also very good because, you know, you will have to go in depth into that subject for that area. It depends how deep they are, they are writing it. For example, can I give an idea? You know, um, maybe Dr. Asanga or, or someone should actually start off a practical guide for arbitration in Sri Lanka. Starting, starting from commencement to award writing to enforcement, split up the chapters, get a practitioner each to write, and suddenly you have a book, which may be the only book that's available <laughs> later in Sri Lanka. No, we did that, but that is very fast to do. And it involves a lot of people. So there is actually a buying in by the community. So, I mean, this is not another way, you know, I mean, uh, because the, the, this is what I see is happening. And it's also very useful to bring out because if you have, let's say, a good editor and you set up the structures are very clearly, people can bring it up to that standard. And uh, everybody's um, uh, uh, the, 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 the knowledge is actually collected. So it's important to publish. I, I think it's important to publish. And uh, it is the level of publication that goes up uh, to a high level that shows the level of the jurisdiction also. Thank you, Professor. Professor, there is also a question from one of our uh, uh, attendees. And the question is basically, what insight can you give with regard to building a career in um, arbitration in the area of domain names. Right. 
Um, it is a speciality field. It is not very difficult to do. Domain name is actually IP, intellectual property. Uh, it relates to, uh, uh, normally, you know, somebody will have, you know, I mean, in the modern world, we all have websites. We have all kinds of uh, uh, domain arrangements and all these things. These websites could be, some people will buy up, let's say McDonald's, they will go and buy up uh, golden arches all over the world. And then when McDonald's turns up there, the golden arches is actually already bought over. So they will try to actually uh, uh, negotiate. And then this person will start a domain name uh, arbitration. A domain name arbitration is actually a misnomer. It's not an arbitration per se. What you have is actually a tribunal deciding and telling the registrar to transfer the, the domain name or give some kind of a, a, a remedy uh, in dealing with the domain name. But because the, uh, in, the internet is so big nowadays, the number of disputes in domain name is growing and growing and growing. What we don't have in South Asia is uh, uh, an organized group dealing with this. We have the Asian domain name, which I was the chair in 2018, uh, of a number of institutions, uh, Hong Kong, uh, uh, HKIC, SI, no, no, HKIC, KCBA, CTEC, and AIC at the time. So uh, we formed and we got the license, a common license from, uh, uh, from uh, what do you call UDRP. So, uh, so the biggest domain name uh, institution in the world is WIPO, a World Intellectual uh, Property Organization. Uh, so I, I think you know, it is actually quite a good field to go to. It is repetitive work. The nature of the work is quite straightforward, but it requires you to deal only with documents. Everything is online. You have to, you know, I, I, I have appointed domain name arbitrators from all over the world, Australia, Latin America, Ireland, India, you know, Malaysia, Hong Kong, China, you know, it is a growing field. If you look at Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, uh, it has about, let's say about 70 to 100 cases of domain name. CTEC has about 180 cases, I think, and it's growing. It's, a, it's something that's growing, but if you go to WIPO, they have thousands. So that is a field. I think it's a very pertinent question. It is something that you can actually train for and get yourself registered uh, in the various arbitral institutions, get a WIPO uh, uh, panel membership, and they will start to appoint you because it is, it is so easy. You know, All you need is a good connection and you have very strict time frames, and you must perform. Thank you. Uh, so, is it possible for you to also share some views on sports-related arbitration? Because that's a new field in Sri Lanka. And, uh, but I mean, very soon we will be starting a Premier League, you know, fashion uh, after the Indian Premier League. And with that, there will be big sports contracts entered into between players and clubs and so on. And very likely there will be disputes. So how do you see the relevancy of sports-related arbitration as an area of uh, interest for a young practitioner? I, you know, it's, it's very, very strange. When, when I was five FIFA deputy uh, chairman of the adjudicatory chamber, uh, I, I realized something. But before that, I was really thinking about it. We wanted to do sports. Perhaps that's why I was chosen to go to FIFA. But uh, the thing is that uh, sports is the next frontier. Sports arbitration is the next frontier. As Asia becomes the powerhouse of sports and more and more professional sports are being played, premier uh, leagues, uh, you know, all kinds you know, of athletics, field, uh, field uh, uh, I mean, you, you just, it's like, it will be, there will be a lot of disputes. There are two types of disputes, you know, one of course, selection disputes and all these things. The other one is the sponsorship disputes. And um, the main player in the world is based in Switzerland, CAS. FIFA is also based in Switzerland. Uh, so, you know, of all sports disputes uh, go to two organizations, basically. One is WADA, which is the doping, World Anti-Doping uh, Agency. Then you have CAS, uh, Court of Arbitration Sports. 
So you have these two, and you know what we don't have in Asia. This was my ambition, which I wanted for Malaysia, the Asian Sports Tribunal. But I would encourage every jurisdiction to set up a sports uh, arbitration initiative. If you are having domestic, in fact, I think it depoliticizes sports. Once I tell you one one thing that I I I'm I'm an avid uh, football. Uh, you know, I love uh, football. In, in uh, you know, I really wanted to see Malaysian football go up because there was so much politics in Malaysian football. I said, you know, maybe the best way to do this is to depoliticize. And if any dispute about selection, you just go to a, a tribunal which is independent and impartial. And straight away, when you decide that, uh, and they follow it, and perhaps everything in, improves. You know, because we we have all kinds of politics because it's such a popular game, and it's such a image uh, 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 gaining thing for a pop populist, they all want to get involved. And once they get involved, it becomes very, very politicized. Then you'll find that uh, the, the grain doesn't improve. And sometimes the fights in associations is terrible. It can bring down the whole association. You know, this is where I think uh, sports arbitration can come in because actually it can vary anything related to sports, any kind of uh, 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 dispute will be dealt with an independent uh, structure and it will be people who are trained in sports law. So I think this is something that I've been very excited about. And this is something that we should look in Asia because we don't have those structures. You know? uh, we were looking at, of course, maritime is coming up, domain name is coming up, sports is something that we don't have. And I would encourage Sri Lanka to go for it and try to build an alliance, you know, bigger alliance, bigger group, so that you all have a bigger area to cover and form, uh, you know, we, maybe we should form, you know, I'm, I'm still in for this Asian sports tribunal. <laughs> if we can actually uh, uh, put our heads together and uh, locate it properly with good law and then uh, an independent tribunal and then we train people. I, I used to train people. Uh, I brought uh, uh, Richard Mac McLaren of WADA. You know, you remember the one he did, the Soviet uh, anti-doping. I brought Paul Hayes from Australia, uh, Malcolm Perfect. Holmes. Uh, so all these people are well known, huh? but we need Asian experts. We should talk about this more, perhaps when we meet next time. Uh, yeah, of course. See <laughs> and what we can, you know, develop. So uh, there's a very interesting question that has come from one of our listeners, and um, so the the question is this: the as you know, confidentiality is one of the very important key important factors in arbitration. And we all see confidentiality of the dispute between the parties as an advantage of arbitration. However, when one of the parties to arbitration is a government entity, there is also a public interest element with regard to the disputed facts and the outcome. So how do you see the two interests, you know, these competing interests being balanced uh, in an arbitration context? Uh, generally, I think the, the, the default situation is arbitration is private and confidential. So it's uh, private and confidential uh, because the parties being business people do not want their, their, their dispute to be aired publicly. You know, they will go to court, you know, because there's a public gallery that it is reported in the news. Of course, you know, with our, our arbitration reporting, the news of any win or any arbitration starts up quite fast, you know, because I, I say like GAR, the Global Arbitration Review is the greatest purveyor of uh, 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 no, uh, confidential information <laughs> because they seem to know all the things. Uh, where public interest is concerned, in fact, that is the exception that was dealt in the ESO case. If you all remember the, 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 the Parliament versus ESO in, the, in, in the Australia in the 90s, and they said there is no confidentiality per se. But I think most of the countries in most of uh, many of the commercial, uh, international commercial arbitration, or even there is an implied rule that it is going to be confidential unless the parties agree otherwise. There's a contrary intention. Okay, the contrary intention, you will find that it is suggested in ITSIC arbitrations. That means investment party arbitrations where the state is actually carrying a burden you know, because it is it is being sued on behalf of an investment that comes into the country. It could be other parties involved, but the state has to carry that. And it is actually going to be taxpayers' money that's going to go out if they loses the case. And there is a public interest. 
in that. I, I, I think I agree with that. I think that, that exception is now quite clearly established uh, in, in the world. But so uh, I think uh, uh, what is happening around is that legislation is now being passed uh, to say what is the level of confidentiality and even things like going to court. If it's a commercial uh, international arbitration, it may even the, the hearing could be in camera. I mean, they are going to that level. But where there is a public interest, I think there is a public has a legitimate right to know there is now this issue of what is called transparency. So transparency is now the third arm between privacy, confidentiality, and we have now what is transparency. So any discussion uh, on that area has to be these three areas. Thank you very much. Um, before I uh, invite uh, Janaka to say a few words, are there any final thoughts that you would like to leave us with, you know, on based on your own career progression? Uh, I think one thing that you must accept that all careers have ups and downs. Um, when you're up there, uh, be grateful <laughs> and be clear and be happy about it, enjoy it. Uh, but when you're down, never give up. Just reinvent yourself, continue. I think that's uh, the thing because, uh, you know, sometimes you work very hard and uh, you may feel that you have done a lot, but and if it goes down, uh, it is all right, you know, because the work is there. But if you, if it's, if it, if you're doing very well, always share, always share, uh, be, uh, I think, look at the younger people. I, I, I'm, I'm really but quite keen to actually, you know, one of the things I've been working on in a book in India, I've just used young people, you know, and I, I am so fascinated by the quality of the talent and the ability. Of course, they have all kinds of excuses, some of them, but the, those who persevere are extremely good and they deserve attention from us. So I think that that's my parting word. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Janaka. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you would have agreed with me that uh, we witnessed an interesting and thought-provoking piece of presentation by Professor Sundar Raju. With that, we have come to the end of our today's webinar. Thank you, uh, Professor Sundra and Dr. Gunawansa for joining us today and sharing your views and experiences. I'm sure that many aspiring arbitrators were inspired by your words. As I know personally, Professor Sundar Raju is not only an academic, but also a visionary and a thought leader who single-handed whose single-handed efforts earned his motherland many accredits and victories, especially in the field of international arbitration. Dear Professor, thank you once again for joining us today despite your busy schedule, and we do hope that you will be able to join us again in the near future. I must also you. thank your team at the Asian Institute of Alternative Dispute Resolution, especially Heather and APRI for their support and making this webinar a success. Yes. And my sincere gratitude also goes to our president, Mr. Kailing, Mr. President's Council, Secretary of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, Mr. Rajiv Amrasuria, Assistant Secretary of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, Mr. Pasindu Silva, and our team of energetic, uh, team of lawyers, Ms. Anne Devananda and Ms. Nelum Jayasinghe for their efforts. This was an effort uh, of the International Relations Committee of the Bar Association. I'll be failing in my duty if I do not thank Dr. Gunawansa, Mr. Anurudha Pereira and Mrs. Champika Amarsekara, who are the office bearers of IR committee for their relentless support and advice. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you at our next webinar on Thursday, the 19th of November on cryptocurrency and the latest international developments on, in commercial and criminal law. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen. Have a pleasant evening. Yeah, thank you so much.